Yes, welcome back to another edition of the Mintcast, the podcast from Mint Press News. We're going behind the headlines and diving into the biggest issues of the day. I'm your host this week, Alan McLeod. Now, today we're talking about China, and few countries, if any, have risen so rapidly as China. Just 20 years ago, the words made in China were synonymous with low-quality junk. But today, China leads the world in futuristic technologies such as high-speed rail, 5G, communications, electric vehicles, quantum computing, and more. Even more impressive is its poverty reduction, with more than 800 million people pulled from the ranks of destitution in the past 40 years. Yet, even as China undoubtedly rises, it has gained many enemies in the West, particularly in Washington, D.C. To talk about China's past, present, and future, we're joined by John Ross. John is an economist and a senior fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at uh, Renmin University of China. You can read his work at learningfromchina.net. But before we get into it, if you'd like to support the show and you want to see it grow, please do consider supporting us financially on Patreon. There will be a link in the description uh, of wherever you're watching or listening to this. If you're not in a position to help financially, you can still help us by liking and sharing this content with your friends and colleagues. So without further ado, John, welcome to the show. I used to be here. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you because China is a topic that so many people worldwide are interested in and have almost been forced to become uh, interested in uh, just watching just how rapidly it is transforming. But few in the West really understand the place. And... This sort of lack of understanding has led to a lot of uh, extremely dubious takes and shallow understandings of the country. Uh, what do you think, as somebody who's spent a lot of time there and has really studied it and literally written the book about it, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about China, its people, its society, or its economy that we hold uh, over here in the West? Well, the most important is what an incredible improvement there's been in the lives of um, China's people. I mean, when I started to write on China this 30, 31 years ago, I wrote my first big article on China. People said, why are you so interested in China? It's a it's a a very poor country. Uh, Let's study somewhere else, you know, Germany or Japan or something. Uh, and uh, I said, it's got the correct economic policies. It's going to be incredibly successful. If you don't believe me now, just wait and see. Now now it's not necessary to explain to anybody why you should be interested in China. Um, you only have to switch on the television every day on the BBC or Bloomberg or anything, uh, not merely China channels, and you'll get um, umpteen stories about China. And the reason for that, of course, is its success in that period of time. Uh, but but people don't understand the scale of this success, and they still don't understand, therefore, what it means for the transformation of the lives of ordinary Chinese people. So let me give you just a little bit of data. In 1949, when the People's Republic of China was created, China was almost the poorest country in the world. If you take the data from Angus Madison, who's the top expert on long-term economic growth, only 10 countries in the world had a lower per capita GDP than China. Um, so it was almost the poorest country in the world. But you have to understand what poverty meant. If you take comparisons, China had a lower per capita GDP than England at the time of Shakespeare. That's what it means. It's almost like going back to the Middle Ages. Um, life expectancy at that time, if you, there were various estimates of it, it between 35 and the maximum, the ab- normal one's about 35. Some people calculate as much as 42, but you know, as, uh, as much as 42 tells you what the, um, uh, what the situation is. Right. But now in only just over 70 years, that is in a single lifetime, China's got to the situation whereby it's not, not merely that about the most developed of the developing countries. There's only a tiny number of more developed, but it's on the brink of being a high-income economy by World Bank standards. Um, It'll achieve that either next year or the year after. Depends basically what the exchange rate does. Can you imagine this? This means that in a single lifetime, you go from almost the poorest country in the world to be in a high-income economy. And this is not a question of concrete and steel. It affects every aspect of the lives of the people. It means that, for example, last year, life expectancy in China was higher than in the United States. Um, 
it means that life expectancy in China has all approximately or or or, or about double, depending on which what you take as the starting starting point in a single lifetime. If you want to know, for example, why why is Mao Zedong so popular in China, it's because it, it during the uh, twenty seven years in which he was right in charge of China, leading China, life expectancy went up by thirty one years. And life expectancy is not only the fact that most people want to live for a long time, but economists know that life expectancy is the best indicator of overall social conditions because it takes all the positives, good income, good education, good health service, environmental improvement, takes out all the negatives, poverty, uh, bad environment, bad health service, bad education, etc., and produces you a single number, sort of like the human body acts as a computer about whether the situation is good or the situation is bad. Now, if someone leave, leads you, leave aside the question of getting rid of the foreign concessions of China, if someone leads you to live 31 years longer, you tend to feel rather well disposed towards them. And therefore, you can't understand what the, the support that Mao Zedong has in China and the way he's seen as such an important figure, because you read absolute rubbish in the West. Uh, about this without understanding what happened to the lives of people or take a what it means for the lives of young people i think the most complicated social situation in the whole world must be to be a young chinese woman i mean it was put to me by you know in in very well by a chinese friend of mine she said you know, our grandmothers were dealing with, you know, problems such as, you know, that 90 uh, percent of them were illiterate. Right. Now there are more women in Chinese universities, not merely at undergraduate level, but at postgraduate level than there are men. And you have a situation. I had a fast, fantastic discussion with a friend, of, you know, a good friend of mine there. She, she was explaining. She said, she was the first person in from her village to go to university. Now, you don't understand what a village means in China. It's, it's got 10,000 people in it. But in Chinese terms, that's a village. OK, she was the first person to go there. And she explained all the complicated university. She explained all the complicated situations with her, her parents, because, of course, you know, her parents wanted her father, particularly, you know, to get married. She didn't want to get married. Uh, she wanted to go, she, you know, spoke foreign languages. She'd had a very good education. And at the same time, this is, you know, a transformation which has taken place in, in, the, in the lives of people. And you, in China's life, for ordinary Chinese person now, in many ways, is more advanced than it is in the West. There was a rather amusing article which appeared in an American newspaper. Somebody went to China to see what it was like to live without the Internet and so on for a week and they came back and they said well the united states is really primitive i mean nobody virtually nobody in china uses cash anymore everything is done by electronic payments you just show your mobile phone there was a joke i i have to go into a bank periodically because um i, I have to transfer money from 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 china uh to to britain and um my interpreter said look who's in this bank there's only old people and foreigners you know, nobody, nobody who's middle aged or young has said bothered to go and bank in China anymore. They're doing everything by their electronic transactions. So in some some ways, when you come back to Britain, it's like, you know, going back into primitiveness. Um, and this is this is the transformation which has taken place in the lives of the people. If you look at the polls which are done by not by Chinese organizations, but, for example, by Pew Research, which used to be headed by Madeleine Albright, who was a cold warrior, so she can't be accused of being pro-China, you find the polls show that 90% of the population think that the country is going in the right direction, um, compared to, you know, in many cases, under 50% in, in, in Britain or the United States. And why? Because their lives have been totally transformed for the better. And, and that's, therefore, what the most fundamental thing, far from China being some oppressive situation, They've seen their lives totally transformed in 70 years, and every life, every year, their life gets better. If you look at the Institute, uh, the International Labour Organization, it did calculations on real wages. China has by far the highest annual average increase in real wages in in the entire world, uh, by an enormous margin. I mean, about 10 times more than the, uh, the Western countries. So it's not merely the allevi alleviation of poverty which is extraordinarily incredible, but it's the 
continuous improvement of the ordinary living standards of the people. That's it's like it's like you've gone through four hundred years in in seventy years. That's the only comparison you can make, and that's what people don't understand about the situation in China and how how people in China live. So how has that happened then? <clears throat> it's commonly written that China's managed to pull close to one billion people out of extreme poverty, maybe eight hundred and fifty million plus which would surely rank as one of the great humanitarian achievements uh, of the 20th century, 21st century, or even of any century. Um, how has that actually managed to happen? What has the Chinese government actually done to do that? And uh, do you think those numbers are accurate? So they're, they're accurate. They're the, they're, the, they're the compilations of the World Bank. And even that's slightly, the eight, the eight, eight, it's 853 million, if you take the exact time the world bank latest published figure that is their definition of um of poverty internationally it's even a bit more since that because they haven't published the figures for about two or three years and china has eliminated all absolute poverty but anyway let's call it 850 million yeah this is these, these are the calculations which are done by the world bank and they're reflected in all the other things to say life expectancy etc the way it's been done is two things if you take Let's say 750 million out of 850 million. That was done by basically economic growth. China has got the fastest sustained economic growth in any country in world history and affecting far more people. I mean, if you take countries which underwent rapid economic growth, you can go back to Britain, the Industrial Revolution. That's about two and a bit percent of the world's population. The United States after the Civil War, that's three and a bit percent of the world's population. The Soviet Union in 1929, that's 8% of the world's population. But China in 1978 is 22% of the world's population. It's not merely that their living standard got so much big quicker, so fast for such a long period of time. As I say, it's the fastest economic growth in a major economy in world history. But it affected a far bigger proportion of the world's population than any other. Again, just to take the data, I mean, when China becomes a high income economy in a couple of one year or two years time, it's 18 percent of the world's population. But the whole existing pop population of high income economies in the world is only 16 percent. That means China will have lifted more people to the states of a high income economy with all the advantages that that brings education, health, etc. than all the other countries in the world put together. OK, that's what got the 750 million out. But then that's still left 80 to 100 million people who aren't, can't be lifted out of poverty simply by economic growth um, by because they live in remote parts of the country. There are particularly under favorable conditions, etc. So the final 80 to 100 million was done by a targeted poverty alleviation program. This is even more striking, actually, of course, because it compares to the West. Who has the you know ridiculous theory of trickle down, which means that actually people get left behind? You had a a, a huge mobilisation of about uh, you know several million people were involved in tracking down, going into villages, finding out what was the cause of poverty, what could be done about it. In some cases, it was just a question of getting better infrastructure in there, building roads, getting in power supplies. In some places, it was absolutely impossible because where they're geographically located, and you had to propose to the people to be re relocated. So you had to rebuild, you had to build new villages, you had to move people, etc. And and so it was it was the combination. Say, let's call it seven hundred and fifty million was done by uh, economic growth, and hundred million by targeted poverty alleviation programs. That that's the way that the eight hundred and fifty million was done. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Hmm. To what extent uh, are these gains the result of more socialist policies and economic planning, or to what extent is it just the fast growth? And uh, uh, I guess, how would you describe the country's economic system? Is it right to call it socialist, or would you describe it as something else, state capitalist, or an another um, another um, adjective? It's a socialist country by any any standards. I mean, the first you had a socialist revolution. Uh, and secondly, but more importantly, up to the present time, the state continues to develop the economy. You've got to understand, it's not. A, I'd make a distinction between what you could call a planned economy and an administered economy. Let, let's explain what the difference between these two is. An administered economy, which, for example, existed in the Soviet Union, means every single detail is controlled. 
thousands and thousands of prices were controlled. It was illegal to sell a pencil at a different price in Moscow and Vladivostok, although they're thousands of kilometers apart. That means every detail of the economy is being administered. It's not a system. It was fine for the militarization of um, Russia. My, my Russian friends would tell me that after 1929, the decisive problem which confronted the Soviet Union was going to be attacked by Nazi Germany, and it was necessary to build military industry. And they think that, therefore, that was what was necessary and that was what was done. And I'm not going to get into an argument about that. The, we, all we can judge is it won the Second World War. Um, but after that, such an administered economy, for all sorts of reasons we haven't got time to go into, is not efficient. China has a different system. It doesn't attempt to administer the, the, the economy in detail. Most of the prices in the economy are uh, freely set by the market. What it does do is it has a very large proportion of the investment in the country is controlled by the state or by the state organizations, around about slightly over 40%. And this is of the biggest companies, so it has a much bigger effect than simply the size and the, the percentage. And the economy is run by, if the economy is growing too slowly, you can move the state level investment upwards to make the economy accelerate. If the economy is overheating, which happens sometimes, you get inflation, problems like that, you can lower the level of investment and the to cool to cool down the economy. So that is the way that the, the economy is run. And there is no capitalist system runs, runs like that. Let's take a comparison, for example, what happened after the international financial crisis. In the West, you had the deepest economic recession since uh, since the you know, 1929 and the Great Depression. What did the US attempt to do about that? Well, the, the president, okay, you had some although not enough, you know, programs to support income. But as regards investment, which was the key thing, the president would send a letter to, or could send a letter to a company, say, you know, we would like you to invest. It could lend a send a letter to a bank saying, couldn't you lend more? To which probably got a polite reply back, basically saying no. Um, that's not the way that things work in China. In China, the state companies were instructed to invest. The banks were instructed to lend. Um, they had quotas of how much they could be lent, as a result of which the economy didn't go into recession at all after 2008. And there's no capitalist economy in the world which functions like that. So China, China is a socialist economy, not in how it's run and also what its goals are. There's no capitalist economy which has mobilized millions of people in order to carry out a targeted poverty alleviation program. Um, I, I wouldn't be very hostile to, you know, I'd be much less hostile to capitalism if it did such things, but it doesn't do them, of course. Yeah. So China is a, China's a socialist economy, and that then it, what explains the extremely rapid growth, because no capitalist economy has ever grown as fast for such a long time as China has, and that it's because it's a socialist economy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> let me push back slightly on that. Uh, you, you say that, but we have seen a lot of uh, other Asian economies, specific, uh, particularly in that region, you know, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, have state-led growth, and they have had uh, big improvements in quality of life uh, throughout the 20th century. How does China compare to them, and uh, why would you say it's a different system, or would you say that? And secondly, some people often point to the... Uh, presence of uh, the uber wealthy in China, or to talking about very like high profile billionaires, is proof that perhaps uh, this economy isn't quite as socialist as they think. What do you make of those arguments? Well, firstly, it's they're not steady. The examples you look to are not state led growth in the way that China does. None of these countries has uh, has you know over forty percent of the economy is in the state sector. None of them even even remotely come close to that. Right. Secondly, they haven't grown for so for such a long period of time for so fast. Thirdly, they didn't carry out the type of targeted poverty alleviation programs that China did. And as for the question of billionaires, you know, I've read a lot of Marx, but I never read anywhere in Marx in which he said the 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 aim of socialism is that there must be no billionaires. Uh, it, it's a, an incidental question. What what Marx wanted was he wanted the population to be better off. It's the living, what is the living standards of the average people? That's what it's judged by. Uh, you can have billionaires, you can not have billionaires, don't care. It's ir irrelevant. 
to what is the question of what is the situation of people. The aim of socialism is not to suppress billionaires, although when you have fully developed socialism, you won't have billionaires, but that's an incidental matter. What is the question is what is happening to the average living standards of the people, and in particular, with particular attention to what is happening to the least well-off. And by these criteria, China has achieved both. It has the biggest poverty. It has raised more people from poverty than any other country in the world by an enormous margin. By the time, at the time of the data for the 853 million that was published by the World Bank, that was 73% of all the people who had been lifted out of poverty in the world. So there is no poverty alleviation that even remotely comes close to China. There is no increase in living standards or real wages, which even comes anywhere close compared to China. And that's what needs to be focused on. What is the what is the improvement in the ordinary life of people? Nobody, including nobody I know in China, is making out the situation that what we have is heaven on earth and perfection. Um, perfection comes only in heaven when you're dead. Right. What you have is a gigantic improvement in the lives of people. As I say, a total transformation. Understand what it means. It means that you are taking from the per capita GDP of the 16th century to the per capita GDP of a high income economy in just slightly over 70 years. That is the biggest improvement in the conditions of ordinary human beings that has ever occurred in human history. And I will put it very simply, it is the greatest contribution to the improvement of human rights ever made by any country in human history. Now, uh, the economy has certainly grown prodigiously, but there's a considerable worry about an economic slump right now in China, isn't there? Uh, particularly due to the housing crisis. We can read about that in uh, any number of Western outlets right now. And even if you drill down, a lot of opinion pieces are predicting a collapse in the Chinese economy or a meltdown. What do you think about these predictions and about China's current economic state? Is there a problem uh, just now? Is there a slowdown? Uh, is a collapse coming? What do you think? These articles are a farce. I mean, I've been writing on China's economy for 31 years and studying it for longer. And about every year, you have a little mini industry called China's economy is about to crash next year. Right. Well, when it comes to next year, well, they say, well, the China's economy is going to collapse next year. And then when that comes along, they say China's economy is going to collapse next year. It's always next year, you see. Um, I mean, there was, you can, it's farcical. The, these people who write these articles, it's a joke. If, you know, at one time I had to make money by advising companies. If any of these people were advising companies, they'd be sacked immediately. Why, what do they do? You have books written like The Coming Collapse of China, which is written, if my memory is correct, in 2001. Right, okay, 22 years later, it hasn't collapsed, but the person who wrote it still appears on American TV as a China expert. What's their expertise? They haven't got any expertise at all. They've been seriously completely wrong. Or take, for example, The Economist. Um, it was rather funny. I was, um, I was writing an article saying a good way to judge uh, China's economy is the following. Read The Economist and assume that the opposite is going to take place. <laughs> um, the, and I, I wrote that in an article. Well, very funnily, I happened to have a Chinese millionaire friend um, who, who, who passed on to me. Yeah, he said, before he knew my view, he just put, it was a joke. He said, a good way to look at China is to, is to read The Economist and assume that the opposite is going to happen. I mean, they, they were predicting the collapse of China. They were, they were writing special supplements called A Dragon Out of Puff, if my memory is right, in 2002. That didn't happen, of course. It, China was about to enter into 10 years of, of double-digit economic growth. Then they wrote a front cover about how India was going to grow faster than China. That was about 2010. That didn't happen. Now they're writing about peak China. It, the, it's a farce. And let's take the situation. So the latest is um, due to the pandemic in its aftermath. OK, well, let's look at the facts. Let's take the four years since the uh, beginning of the pandemic. China's economy has grown by 19.2 percent total in that period. That's two and a half times as fast as the United States and six times as fast as the eurozone. 
if you take it per capita, because China doesn't have any population increase at the present time, it's more than three times as fast as the United States. So it's a joke. China's economy is growing two and a half times as fast as the United States. And people say, oh, there's a big crisis in China. What? It's absurd. All this is, is pure, absolute propaganda, because made for several reasons. One is they don't want foreign companies to invest in China. So they want to try to pretend the economy is going to collapse. Uh, they want to try to, uh, if anybody pays any attention to sort of spread disorganization and demoralization, doesn't, doesn't occur. And this type of thing has absolutely zero credibility. And I was told the, you know, when I was being educated, I was told, look, if the facts and a the theory don't agree, there's only one thing you can do. A sensible person abandons the theory and a dangerous one abandons the real world, the facts. So that's what they've decided to do. They've decided to abandon the real world. And that's the only thing about this. This is a, a sort of weird type of material, which has been refuted for 31 years and continues to be refuted for 30 years. It is no intellectual credibility to it, whatever. Yeah, I think the expert you're talking about specifically, Gordon Chang, he did write the book, The Coming Collapse of China. I think he wrote it in 2000. It came out in 2001 and it was heralded by the New York Times and every outlet as, you know, being this incredibly insightful book. And then uh, that didn't happen, but he still writes the same article every couple of years. You know, in 2012, you can you can read his new foreign policy article, "The Coming Collapse of China," 2012 edition. And then, actually, just uh, just in July, I remember he wrote uh, an opinion piece called "Communist China Has Peaked." And so, ultimately, Chang seems to uh, live this charmed world where he just keeps predicting the worst, and uh, it doesn't really matter that nothing happens to it. Uh, to China, and he's proved wrong every single time. He's still, uh, he's still invited on Fox or CNN to give his expert opinion, even though it seems that his entire career and his the main point of his uh, entire academic life has been so thoroughly refuted over and over again, which kind of suggests that perhaps um, he's playing a role that uh, doesn't really um, match up with the facts. Um, if you're just joining us, we're... yeah, there, there, there are do, there are dozens of Gordon Changs out there. That's all. That's the only reason I didn't go into the particular individual. Although you're quite right, you, I was referring to him. Yeah, um, your book China's Great Road details the country's uh, rapid em economic growth, but um, the United States is now, in the past few years, with its pivot to Asia under the Obama administration and the Trump sanctions, which have now been. Uh, carried on by the Biden administration has really we've really seen uh, a change in the um, in the relationship between the United States and China. I think in the late twentieth century and maybe the early twenty first, Washington saw China as this very useful place to dump a load of capital somewhere you could make a lot of money by outsourcing cheap manufacturing uh, cheap manufacturing labor to and then bring in the products. But uh, something happened in the twenty tens when the uh, the hawks in Washington decided actually China is growing too fast. And now we're seeing economic sanctions being placed on China by the United States. How is this trade war harming China? Is it having much of an effect or is it harming the United States more? Well, the first thing is it's harming the whole world. I mean, this is a, a very anti-human activity that the United States engage in. What it's trying to do is it's trying to slow down another economy. Why? Because it can't speed up its own economy. I mean, if the United States embarked on a program whereby its, its economy started to grow at 7 or 8% a year, you know, like China had been doing, well, nobody could do anything about it. Nobody, nobody could, firstly, nobody could object to it because its economy, want, you know, it's very good for the American people. If their economy grows fast, they'll get better off. So there's no, there would be no basis to object to it. And anyway, nobody could do anything about it. But, the, but it's not doing that. It's trying to slow down another economy. Well, how does that help humanity? Uh, it means that you've got less powerful in, m locomotive for world growth. Uh, you've got less possibility for good trade relationships with China. And it's also anti-human. I mean, you know, anti-China. I mean, that's why. The United States has virtually no credibility anymore within China because the Chinese people understand what, what they want to do. What the United States is saying is we want the Chinese people to be poorer. We don't want them to have their very good 
uh, standard of living because their economy will become larger than us. And as you can do the arithmetic very simply, um, China has got more than four times the population of the United States. So that the moment that China's per capita GDP, which will be roughly equivalent to living standards, becomes one quarter as high, big as the United States, um, it'll have a per, bigger per capita GDP than China, so th than the US. So that the U what the US wants to say is, in order to be the largest economy in the world, China must never have a uh, living standard, which is even one quarter that of the United States. I mean, can you imagine the Chinese people are going to accept that? But incidentally, the US has got a big second problem coming down the road in about 20 years, which is the Indian people are not going to accept that they only have one quarter of the living standards of the of the united states either so that so this is a great the biggest source of tension in the whole world economically because it was very well put actually by xi jinping who said if you're in a room with various people with a lamp with lamps if you can't make your own lamp brighter you're not gonna doesn't help the situation you try to put out somebody else's lamp now that's why the whole thing is wrong and a source of great tension but also it's not going to work the can it create problems? Yeah, it, it can create some problems uh, for individual Chinese companies, for example. The US succeeded in temporarily demolishing Huawei's mobile, well, demolishing his site, exaggerated, greatly damaging Huawei's mobile phone business by saying it couldn't use Android, etc. This meant for two or three years Huawei was lost its position as one of the leading manufacturing mobile phones in the world. Now what's happened this year is Huawei's launched a new uh, highly uh, efficient phone because it's been able to develop its own chips, its own technology. And the United States can bash on the head one company or other. For example, Huawei, it can ban from the 5G system in Europe or, or in some country in Europe, the United States, the result of which is we pay more for our 5G uh, and the 5G is delivered later than if Huawei was involved. It can do that to one company. The problem is China's going to have 20, 100 companies like that. I mean, it's all, the US is already running into a problem with TikTok because TikTok is on 120 million American phones. Okay, well, if you go back six or seven years, the, the, the myth used to be, have, you have books written about this, you know, China can't develop uh, brands, probably because, you know, they're, they're not white and so they're not, you know, live in some or alleged authoritarian dictatorship. So they can't develop brands. They can produce, you know, commodified type things and assemble iPhones for other people, but they can't develop brands themselves. Well, that's that's hit the dust. I mean, TikTok's become the most visited website in the world. So the US would like to ban it because it's a big problem for them that China's got such a successful consumer company. But the problem is it's well put on Bloomberg. There's 120 million Americans got TikTok on their phone. If you're going to pick an argument with 120 million people, this is not going to necessarily be very electorally popular. So therefore, they haven't even banned TikTok yet, although they've been talking about it for ages. And, and this is the problem. They're going to get company after company, and they're not going to be able to bash all of these down. So it will, it will slow down China's economy a little bit and create some problems. But the fundamental thing is, as long as China's economy is growing two and a half times as fast as the US and generating far more funds for investment than the United States, it will overcome these problems and continue to go more rapidly. I mean, that's why the really big danger in the situation is that the United States is bound to lose in peaceful economic competition. That's just, you know, just what the facts show. The big risk is that the United States is still the most powerful military in the world and will decide that it doesn't want to uh, allow peaceful competition to unfold and starts a war. And this is a very serious one. Some, some people talk rightly in the world that there is existential threat to human civilization from climate change. And this is absolutely correct. I totally agree with this. But before humanity suffers the full consequences of climate change, there's no question, which is, is the United States going to destroy the world and destroy human civilization? through launching a war against China. And that is that is an even greater risk because in peaceful competition, anybody who reads it can already see the United States is going to lose. And therefore, the danger is the United States will decide to abandon peaceful competition and decide to embark on the path of war. 
Yeah, most definitely. I mean, there's a map out there which really shows this perfectly. It's uh, it's a comparison of uh, each country in the world's uh, biggest economic partner in 2000 versus 2020 or something. And uh, yeah, in 2000, the map is just covered in blue for the United States. But uh, in the past 20 years, China has uh, forged links with so many different nations, even uh, even in the United States backyard, as Washington calls it, in Latin America or in Africa or in Asia. They're not only uh, trading, but they're also uh, producing all sorts of critical infrastructure for these nations. And it seems that when the United States uh, turns around and tells African or Latin American or Asian countries that it's uh, China or them, that you have to pick a side economically, I think they're on a losing bet there because already uh, these countries are trading massively with China and it seems that they're going to choose that. But as you said, if uh, the United States can't win the economic war, of course, they are still dominant militarily. And that's really one uh, one aspect of uh, the 21st century that we're going to have to look at very closely because uh, I've long held that uh, the 21st century is going to be dominated by two main uh, issues. One is the catastrophic effects of climate breakdown. And two is going to be the uh, fall of the U.S. empire vis-a-vis -vis China and what sort of um, what sort of uh, conflict that's going to spur out. And of course, right now, the United States for the past 10 years has been encircling China with hundreds of military bases. By some estimates, it's up to 400. They're uh, funding separatist movements in Tibet and Xinjiang and, uh, and uh, the protests in Hong Kong. And of course, they are very much uh, getting involved in the China-Taiwan dispute. How likely do you think that is to spill over into uh, a hot war? Uh, wh what's your reading of the China-Taiwan dispute and uh, how dangerous it could be for the wider region? Well, it is extremely dangerous because this is a case where we know that there are people in the United States who advocate a war with China provoked over Taiwan. This is not a secret position. I mean, there are books written about it. The people write about it openly. This is not you know, reading the tea leaves, right? It is a minority view because their argument is that a war over Taiwan could be maintained as a conventional war. Well, that's one hell of a risk. Um, and um, I, at the present time, the majority in the United States of, of the military and foreign policy establishment don't think, think that that risk is too great. You know, if you start a war over the question of Taiwan, you know, China is very, very clear. Taiwan has been part of China. It's going, it is, it, it is a red line, as they, they put it in China. They're not going to give up on this situation. And if the United States provokes a war over China, it, you're, both start, sides are nuclear powers. Uh, you start a war over something which is regarded as a red line existential issue by China. Are you able to guarantee that this is going to remain a conventional war? I really think that you that's one hell of a risk for humanity. And I think at the present time, that's the estimate which is taken by the majority of the US foreign policy and military establishment. I'm, I'm not great fans of theirs, to put it mildly, but I think that is a rational judgment that they make. But the problem is that the situation is going to get worse because the, the US economic policy is, is not going to succeed. I mean, there are ways you could speed up the US economy, and that's what they should be concentrating on. Instead of attempting to slow down China, there are a number of things that could be done without even having socialism in the United States, just by reformist program. Uh, they, they waste a ridiculous amount of money on the health service. I mean, almost one-fifth of the US economy goes on health, and they've got a lower life expectancy than any other major uh, advanced country. So you've got the worst health system, which is the most expensive in the world. This is just so it shows the absurdity of private health, not merely from an ideological point of view and its practical outcomes. Well, you could rationalize that. You could release three or four percent of GDP. If you introduce a proper state run health service in the US, you could release three or four percent of GDP in order to invest and speed up its economy. That's one. Secondly, it spends a ridiculous amount of money on, on the military. That could be cut. I mean, you, you could speed up the U.S. economy. You couldn't speed up that's China, but you could speed up the U.S. economy. Put in a state-run health service and slash the military spending, but you, then you'd have to have a total change in foreign policy. You couldn't have 800 military bases. You couldn't have be running wars. 
all the time. And so unfortunately, the, the sensible reforms which could lead to an increase in the rate of growth in the US are not going to take place. And therefore, the result of which is as it continues to lose the uh, situation, uh, that will go to more extreme measures. I mean, a very scary thing. I, I agree with basically what exactly what you said. I think the two existential threats to humanity are climate change and the threat of nuclear war. These are the two known things that could destroy the present basis of human civilization, possibly the whole of humanity. Um, well, Trump was said when he was in office the first time, uh, well, what's the point of having nuclear weapons if we can't use them? This is what he's alleged to have said. Well, unfortunately, due to the errors of Biden's economic policies, I think there's a very serious risk of Trump being re-elected in 2024, which will have catastrophic consequences from the point of view of climate change and will also have extremely dangerous consequences from the point of view of um, military uh, confrontation. So the, the situation around Taiwan is very, uh, very worrying indeed. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the United States has now um, instructed Australia to purchase these nuclear powered subs. It's building nuclear bases in Australia as we speak, or at least bases that are capable of uh, holding uh, US nuclear subs or other nuclear weapons. Australian senators who've asked the United States publicly whether the US is holding nuclear weapons in their country have been told that they're not allowed to know that. Uh, the United States is building up an Asian NATO, as it, as it calls it, the Quad, as uh, it's known uh, informally, um, uh, full of uh, nations, pliant nations who don't really want to see China continue to grow in the way it's growing. Um, I don't know. I mean, when you say, you know, the US could um, pursue economic policies which would lead to growth, I do agree. But on the other hand, uh, I'm reminded of another New York Times columnist, um, Thomas Friedman, who once said McDonald's couldn't exist without McDonald and Douglas. And I think what he meant by that was that um, the US military is really the enforcer of uh, the United States economic prosperity. It bashes other countries on the head and forces them to sign uh, trade deals which uh, allow American brands into their country. And you know that's kind of the reason that we're all watching American TV shows rather than Chinese or Vietnamese or Turkish or German or whatever. It's because of this sort of huge cultural imperialism that comes from the United States. So yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know how successful the United States would be in uh, pursuing a, more of a sort of economic, uh, more of an economic growth strategy. Just because I think a lot of its um, a lot of its fundamental basis, a lot of its wealth comes from the fact that it's sucking wealth from other countries. But uh, I do want to pick up on something you said about climate change because uh, often you'll talk. You know, There's really two different uh, schools of thought here. A lot, of, a lot of people will criticize China for being a very dirty country in terms of using an awful lot of coal. But then you'll also see people saying actually China is leading the way in all sorts of um, green technologies, whether that's solar panels or photovoltaic cells, electric vehicles, um, high speed rail, etc. What's your view on uh, how China is uh, trying to tackle climate change? Do you think it's doing a good job or do you think it, there's still room for improvement? Or uh, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, there's, there's two different questions there. Um, um, interlinked ones. The first is um, the claim of that China is uh, the big problem about climate change is just false, because it's, you've got to look at if you've got to look at climate change, you've got to look at it from a per capita point of view. Unless you've got the position, of course, that you know white people living in Western Europe in the United States should be allowed to emit um, uh, carbon, but people uh, brown and yellow people living outside of the Britain, uh, the, out of the United States and Europe shouldn't be allowed to emit carbon. Um, that is, if you assume that everybody's got the same right to emit carbon, then you've got to look at it a per capita basis. And on that, the United States is by far the worst polluter in the world from the point of view of carbon emissions, not merely historically, but at the present time of major countries. And the way that it poses the question of carbon reductions is fake, because it poses them in terms of percentage reductions. Well, OK, that means if the United States is... Um, emitting twice as much carbon per person as China, which is roughly the situation, and you reduce both by 50%, then the United States will still be emitting twice as much carbon per person as China. And that's got nothing. Their whole way of constructing this issue about percentage reductions is a complete fake way 
of dealing with the question. What you've got to look at is that each human being has got a carbon budget because we know what is the point at which you're going to have uh, you're going to pass the 1.5 degrees of warming threshold, and what is each ha what is happening in each country from the point of how much they're going above this threshold, above this budget, and the United States is going far above this budget more than China. That's that's the first thing about it the whole way we've got to get set up in what is a simple democratic way which is each human being is going to have to have the same limits on the amount of carbon that they're allowed to admit right then secondly what is china role in all this well china is the biggest force which is going to make it possible to deal with the question of um, global warming if the if the politicians in the west can get their act together that is because i'm not totally hopeful uh, that we're going to be able to deal with it that way because it's China's manufacturing prowess which has dealt with the question, particularly renewable energy, because energy supply is the single biggest factor, then transport. It's China's uh, manufacturing which has made solar power, wind power, completely um, cheaper now than fossil fuels. So if we go back 20 years, uh, renewable energy was much more expensive to generate than was fossil fuels. Now it's cheaper than fossil fuels. Why? Because of China's manufacturing. That's what's happened there. Then if you take, for example, electric vehicles, the situation is China has far more electric vehicles than uh, any other country in the world. It's revolutionized in the motor industry. It's becoming the world's largest motor ex exporter. Why? Because it's exporting electric vehicles. The last time I looked at it, I mean, it's absurd. There's more more electric buses in Shenzhen, one city in in China, if my memory is correct, than in the whole of the United States. So, and the United States is going exactly down the fossil fuels route by fracking, uh, which is the only real part of the American industry which is really growing uh, rapidly. So it's. China's leading the way from the point of view of the uh, dealing with the question of climate change. And it's going to be, we're going to rely upon China's manufacturing in order to be able to get the renewable energy solutions, the electrical vehicle solutions and other solutions, which enable us to deal to deal with this. That's that's just a fact of the world. I guess um, a lot of the problem with the um with actually like uh, judging these things is that we're also not comparing like with like because of course when we look at chinese emissions a lot of the time we're looking at uh you know companies that are creating products a lot of the time they're western uh companies creating products in china for western audiences and then suddenly that's actually budgeted into chinese um carbon emissions as well so all of the stuff in my room that's made in china will probably count towards chinese emissions rather than western emissions when we've simply outsourced a lot of our dirty technology to asian countries and furthermore we're even blocked from buying uh, chinese electric vehicles in the west due to tariffs or certain laws which means we're not actually able to get our hands on all of this green technology unfortunately no, that's absolutely correct. But I was taking even, I was simply using the worst case. It becomes even worse if you take it from who is responsible for the emissions. I, but even if you take a purely geographical definition of where the emissions take place, um, it's that still remains the case. So your your case adds, just reinforces it even further, that's all. All right. Well, we don't have too much time and uh, left, so I want to be respectful of that. So I do want to talk a little bit more about China in the world. Um, Chinese businesses have really been expanding a lot globally. Uh, the country has signed all manner of trade deals with countries in the global south to boost trade and infrastructure. What do you make of China's role in Africa, Asia, Latin America, both economically and diplomatically? Well, it, I think a very good way to look at it is go and look at the Belt and Road Initiative, as it's called. That is China's basic development strategy which takes in basically the global south i mean 150 countries well, 149 to be absolutely precise the last time i looked it up countries have joined the belt the belt and road initiative against the opposition of the united states why have they done this because the belt and road initiative it's not a pro china policy it's a pro development policy i mean you've got the most extraordinary range of countries with different political systems in this i mean You've got socialist countries. Oh, well, let's take the Belt and Road Initiative, ASEAN and, and BRICS, because they're all basically the same type of thing. They're 
non-aligned, uh, multi-different type of political system organizations. If you take, and they all overlap with each other, you've got every conceivable type of political system within this. You've got socialism in China and Vietnam. You've got monarchies in Thailand and, and Saudi Arabia. You've got an, an Islamic republic in Iran. You've got any number of secular republics. So there's no uniformity in these political systems, whatever. They've got all sorts of different development strategies, but they come together. Why, why do they come together? Because they're countries. The, the United States is, put it objectively, the world's biggest economic parasite. The interest in the U.S. capital stock is chiefly financed now by, particularly in the last two years, by import of capital from abroad. But what, is, what does that mean? That means the United States is taking capital that other countries could use for their own development. It's it's a parasite. You know, I'd call it the, the parasitic mode of capital accumulation. That's what exists in the United States. Uh, therefore, basically, if you enter into good economic relations or enter into economic relations in the United States, what they really want, the United States really wants you to do is you to expect your capital, export your capital to the United States so that they can use it. Well, that doesn't help your economy very much. If you look at China, what you have is China is certainly carrying out foreign investment. It is ca it doesn't rely upon any significant import of capital from abroad, and you have economic um, development. It's a pro development policy, a win win, as they put it, in China, and that's why so many countries are participating in, in this. Thing. You sometimes read this nonsense about Chinese imperialism. It was put very very well by an African uh, scholar who's now at a Canadian university on a little video. He put it for everybody. He said, what, what would China have to do to become an imperialist power like the Western ones in Africa? Well, it would first have to kill several million Africans. Then it would have to make the Africans work on plantations. They would impose a racist system with China at the top and the Africans at the bottom. And then it would have to periodically go and bomb uh, uh, governments that it didn't like. That's what China would have to do in order to come like the West. So this idea of what China spread in imperialism in Africa and these countries is absolute nonsense. The, the reason that 150 countries have joined the Belt and Road Initiative, despite the United States, is because they find it economically beneficial to be with, the, with China. There's not 150 countries in the world that are pro-China, but there are 150 countries in the world that want to get on with their own economic development. So that's so what all this talked about is complete nonsense about um, you know China's imperialist policies and all this this type of thing. And I think that's going to really uh, redraw the boundaries of the world in terms of economic blocks. Do you see do you see stuff like this uh, actually helping uh, the the global South uh, raise their standards of living to the point where we might see countries right. in Western Europe and North America see their standards of living fall and uh, the world's becoming uh, a lot more multipolar or at least uh, bipolar in that sense? Well, I, I don't think that, that the standard of living in Western Europe is going to fall or in Europe or the United States is going to fall due to the rise of the global south. That would be rather a win-win because there'd be more possibility for trade. The living standards in Europe and the United States are falling because of the very bad policies which are being pursued by the US and European governments. I mean, if you look, I mean, look at the situation in Europe. We got a disaster. Uh, we got the we got um, the slow, very slow economic growth, high inflation, and a big war. I mean, you know, it's a dreadful situation which exists on that. What's really caused that? Well, the expansion of NATO is what caused that. The United States insisted upon expanding into NATO into into Eastern Europe. This created a big war because that's what's really what's behind the war in Ukraine, um, and it's done economic damage to other countries, particularly, of course, um, to Germany. So therefore, and real wages in the United States have fallen for the last three years. That's got nothing to do with what's happening in the rise of the global south. So we have got a bad situation for living standards in, in the United States and Western Europe. If you look at the rise of the global south, yeah, I mean, the, the global south economies are growing most much more rapidly than the developed economies, thankfully. Um, the socialist economies like China are growing the fastest of all, but there are other, other countries in the global south which are growing fast. And therefore, what is happening with China is you've got two processes going on. One is the global south is growing more rapidly than the global north anyway, even independently of the situation in China. But then China's strength in infrastructure, construction, in investment aids this process. So 
if you like, China's China is going in the same direction as the global south and speeding it up a bit. But very fortunately, the global south is growing rather well and more rapidly. Overall, of course, there are some countries with very deep problems. I'm talking about a general trend there. Is growing better than the global south, is growing better than the global north, which is very desirable from the point of humanity. We've been speaking with John Ross, the economist and senior fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University of China. John, I've got one last question for you today. I think a lot of people uh, are really hungry for information, news and sources about China, which perhaps um, don't quite fit in with what you might read in the New York Times, or the Washington Post. I would just ask you, where can we learn a bit more about China and also to piggyback on that, where can we uh, follow you and uh, read more of your work? Oh, well, the, my the, the best place to follow me is on my Learning from China website. The um, Actually, frankly, the best way to follow China at all is to read the Chinese media. I mean, and in Chinese, most people don't understand nowadays how good translation software is. You can follow the Chinese media very well. For example, the best website in China to follow every day, I follow it every day before I even get out of bed, is Guancha, which is G-U-A-N-C-H-A dot C-N. It's the leading non-state website in China. I mean, by all means, follow People's Daily or Global Times and the state ones as well. That will give you China's official position. But if you don't want to follow that, and some people don't, follow Guancha. It's the it's the most influential progressive non-state website in the world with tens of millions of hits every single day. And you can read it with translation software. No, no problem at all. If not, there are a number of people who write, for example, on on Twitter. Um, I write on Twitter. Uh, you can find other people on no, no Cold War writing on China um, and Tricon produces very good stuff. Another very good place is MR Online. That's Monthly Review Online, which carries a very good range of material from China. And that those are places in which you can follow what is happening in China. Um, that's so it's it's really not easy. But really, I know that people find it odd, but the by far the best is just turn go to a Chinese website, use Chrome or Edge, and you can read what the hell they're saying themselves without having to have anybody in the West. Um, give, act as an intermediary for it at all and I that's literally what I do every morning when I wake up I go to Guancha I read what their headlines are I read the most interesting articles and that keeps me what go, up with what's going on in China Great, thank you so much for joining us on uh, this week's edition of the Mintcast, John Thank you, very nice to be here yeah, I hope everybody's learned uh, a lot about China by listening to uh, two white British guys talk about it. But hopefully <laughs> we'll, uh, uh, we've uh, at least sparked some interest there. If you made it this far, uh, just allow me to plug our Patreon again. You will find a link in the description if you want to help us economically. Uh, if you're not in a position to do that, please do just uh, like the, the stream, share it with your friends as well. Okay, until next week, see you guys later.